Okay, so thanks again, everyone, and welcome to this um, third community chat of the year. And thanks for turning up live. And um, as I said before, um, there'll be some of you turning up live that I've seen before, and thanks for turning up again. And also thank you for the people who are watching this on replay. Thank you for your interest. And thank you to Peter Owen and Emily for all the work that they do behind the scenes to make this all possible. So as some of you know, my name is Kat Smith and I'm a former counselling psychologist turned holistic health coach after decades of a journey with chronic fatigue, so chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, multiple chemical sensitivities, IBS and uh, many other labels. So yes, welcome again to this CCI and Tickner community chat, which is the third of the year, as I said before, on the topic of starting a new habit, um, which is part two following on from part one from last month. So for those of you who weren't here before, I'll just do a brief recap of what we talked about last time. We talked about the importance of your why last time. Your vision of why you want to change and the values that underpin that. And we did an exercise together about why, deep in your heart, you want your health, which gets at what's important to you in your life and your values. So many people will like would want to skip this step, but it's actually really important for your ongoing journey with change to be really clear about why you would want to put the effort into changing. So that will sustain you through the ups and downs of the normal part of the change process. And I talked about also that it's important to, um, to have an idea of what your values are. So values are your heart's deepest desires of how you want to behave, the qualities you want to embody in your own ongoing actions, how you want to treat anyone or anything you are interacting with, including yourself. So, for example, treating yourself and others with the value of self-care, kindness or friendliness, or it might be that being adventurous and creative and playful are important to you, and they're just some examples of some values. If you can design your goal in relation to your values, it'll be much more powerful. We also talked about intrinsic or internal motivation as opposed to external motivation, which is doing something because an outside person says you should or demands that you change, and this is not usually as successful. It might work in the short term, but not usually sustainable in the long term. And then we talked about these positive emotional attractors and finding your own personal positive emotional attractor as opposed to a fear-based reason for change is really important. So a vision and the emotional attractor of being able to play with your kids or your grandkids on the beach or to go for a holiday to somewhere you've never been before, they're just examples of the kind of emotional um, attractor that will be taking you towards your goal, that positive reason for changing. And then we talked about SMART goals and we talked about them from the perspective of acceptance and commitment therapy which, as I've shared before, is something that I find really useful. So the S in that model stands for specific. So you think about what I would see you actually doing on a camera if you were doing that new behaviour. Um, M is motivated, as we've talked about, by your values, as well as that it's measurable and adaptive. It helped that, sorry, as well as it, it's also measurable. Um, that is pretty important as, as well that you know when you've got to your goal. If you can't measure it, you won't know that you've got there. A is for adaptive. Um, and that means that it actually improves your life. It helps you to live the life that you want to live, be the person you want to be, as well as achievable and attainable. And T is for time bound. So you really need a time frame that you're committing to. And then we talked about the your smarter goal and that was adding the e and the r and the e's for evaluate so evaluating and revising them to make them smarter goals as you embark on the process of change and we talked about the aspects that support the whole smarter process like tracking your progress 
sharing your goals with a supportive friend or a coach or a counsellor even to help you hold yourself accountable. Holding yourself accountable is, is a, a very big theme in terms of, you know, that it's intrinsic. It's, it's you're doing this for yourself. You're not trying to please or live up to other people's expectations or demands. And then we touched on what might be a smaller action step that would take you towards, for example, a six-month goal in line with the visions and values that we've talked about. So now I wanted to delve into using this thing called tiny habits to design those smaller action steps towards your bigger goal. So BJ Fogg, who's a behavioural researcher at Stanford, he's created a model of behaviour over 20 years of research which underpins his valuable method called tiny habits. It's a way to scale back the behaviour that you're trying to create to make it easy to do, continue to do and to build upon. So firstly, I just want to give you a simplified version of the theory behind the tiny habits model, um, which is, and this slide is a graphic representation of what he calls the fog behaviour model. So as you can see on the vertical axis here, which is labelled motivation, it goes from low to high. And on the horizontal axis, we have ability going from low ability, which means that it's hard to do, to high ability, which make, means it's easy to do. And then the curved line here is what they call the action line, above which you'll be theoretically able to do the behaviour. You will actually do it, the new habit. So at the top of the screen, B equals MAP. So behaviour is a function of your motivation level, your ability to do the behaviour, and the presence of a prompt or a cue. So B equals MAP. So if the behaviour is hard to do, so we're down here on the horizontal axis, you don't have a, much ability and it's hard to do, your motivation has to be very high for you to get over this action line, for you to actually do it. But if the behaviour is easy to do, so we're way at this end of the ability axis, you don't have to go very far up in motivation to get over that action line. And so if it's easy to do, your motivation can be fairly low, but you'll still be able to get over the action line and do it. And as I said in my previous talk, motivation can wax and wane. So solely, solely relying on it to make these big ambitious changes often doesn't work in the long term. So, for example, in this model, you might have a bigger goal which might be to support your brain, your ability to focus and all your bodily functions by improving your hydration. And you might be aiming to drink a certain amount of water per day based on your climate, your activity level, your sex, et cetera. So just for an example, your goal might be to consistently drink at least two litres of water a day by the end of three months. By using these principles, so that's your overarching goal, by using these principles, your initial tiny habit towards that goal could be to take one sip of water from a glass on your desk. And I know that sounds like it's almost ridiculously easy to do, but you do have the option to do more. And if you want to in any one session, but there's no obligation. So it's actually likely that you'll do more. But if you don't, you still have achieved what you set out to do, which will build a positive momentum for change. As BJ Fogg says, people tend to feel great when they do more than what was actually in their tiny habit commitment. And because this approach builds hope, confidence and the feeling that you can be successful, this is often a real game changer for people because all of those things are the opposite of discouragement that happens when people um, have these big, unrealistic, unworkable goals or, or new year resolutions. So to reiterate, using these principles, if you scale back the behaviour to make it really easy to do, you're more likely to do it even when your motivation is low. And now, as you can see from that equation, the B equals MAP, we need to look at the P, which stands for a prompt or a cue. So you need to tie the new behaviour, the new tiny habit, what you want, to something that already happens in your day. 
So as we said, to start tiny in this example of drinking the two litres of water a day, your first tiny step might be to focus on just taking the sip of water. Or it might even be just to fill up a glass of water and take it to your desk or wherever you are in the day, which might be your starting point. And he calls this a, a starter step, which is kind of to get you ready to even do the tiny habit. So what you need to consider is where in your day would this new habit fit in? Uh, what would it naturally follow? That you or something that you already do. So for example, that could be perhaps after you hang up the phone when you finish a call, then you will take a sip of water. Or after you get a notification, so you hear a ding on your phone, then I will take a sip of water. If you want a habit to happen multiple times in a day, it's helpful to pair it with something that also already happens multiple times in a day. It's also supportive if the habit if the habit and the cue naturally happen in the same physical location. And the third step in his model is to associate this new habit with a positive emotion. So when you take a sip <laughs> or fill your glass and put it on your desk, Fogg's approach is to create positive emotion by saying to, to yourself something like, I'm looking after my brain by drinking more water. Yay for me. Or to celebrate in whatever way you would pers personally celebrate a win. So it might be something just as simple as, um, you know, just a little smile on the corner of your cheeks. It might be something quite low key, but that for you is a way of celebrating that you've done it. To think about it, you might think about what would you do if your team kicked a goal or scored a touchdown, you know, or anything else that's important to you that you would usually celebrate? How, how would you do that? So new neural networks are strengthened, firstly by repetition, and secondly by the neurochemistry of this emotion of celebration. There's a neurochemical called dopamine which plays a really big role in this. So by rewarding yourself in this way, you are creating an internal or intrinsic reinforcement of the behaviour as opposed to relying on an extrinsic reward like praise from someone else or something you might give yourself like a piece of cake, which also might not be very in line with your health goals. So in a way, it's like an instant reward that you give yourself many times rather than something that you promise to give yourself down the track when you actually achieve the goal. For example, I'll buy myself, say, a new item of clothing when I'm drinking two litres of water a day, like at the end of that three months. Fogg would actually call that an incentive rather than this reward. So this reward happens every time you do the behaviour, I take the sip of water, yay, I'm looking after my brain. So that's happening multiple times and it's this positive emotion and this kind of celebration, it literally wires the habit into your brain. So this is actually really important part of it. It might feel at first a little bit, um, you know, a bit fake or something. So that's why I said like just a way that you would do that with just like a little smile, like, yay, I'm looking after myself. So all of what I've just talked about is incorporated into what Fogg calls the tiny habit recipe. So I'll just try and that. So you can see from this slide, um, there's the, he also calls the cue or the prompt, the anchor moment. And that is after which you plan to do the behavior. So finding an existing routine in your life that will help you to do the tiny behaviour, something that's already very well entrenched in your day. And also taking into account what I mentioned before about finding something in your day that already happens multiple times if you want the tiny habit to happen multiple times. And also finding something that would happen in the same physical location where you want the ha habit to happen is also helpful. So like while I'm sitting at my desk, my phone will maybe ding and that after that I will drink the water and then I will celebrate and then so after that happens 
there's the I will do this, the new tiny behavior, the new habit that you want, but scaled back to be very tiny and, and super easy. So as I said before, working towards the goal of consistently drinking two liters of water per day by the end of three months could be after I hear the notification ding on my phone. So the anchor moment after I hear it, I will take a sip of water and I will say to myself, good for me for supporting my brain health. And you can remember the steps of the tiny habit recipe with A for anchor, B for the behavior, the tiny behavior, and C for celebrate. And as with SMART goals, after you start putting your tiny habit into action, you also need to check in and evaluate how it's going and revise the recipe as needed. And in this slide, I'm giving you the link to a, um, a web page that can actually help you to create your own tiny habit online. Um, and I'll just stop sharing this slide and actually show you the um, the website because I think it's quite interesting to see. But before I do that, I'll just make it clear that um, BJ Fogg's team wanted me to make it clear that this is actually a beta version of the tool and it, that it may help you to find the right habit recipe for yourself. So I'll just stop sharing that for a second. And then I'll share this website or web page. Hopefully you can see that. So here we have this recipe making page and you can see examples under various categories uh, on the left here of the habit that you would want. And so they're under categories like nutrition, um, stress, relationships, caring for others, brain health, better sleep. You can just scroll through them all and find something that you're interested. You may already know what you want, so you could just find it or you might get inspiration. And then on the other side of the possible anchor moments or the cue or the prompt after which you want to do the new behaviour. So, for instance, here it's after I um, turn on the kettle. And there's many others like um, all of these, pour a cup of coffee, make a cup of coffee, take my vitamins, etc. So I just go back to uh, start this. And this little lock symbol down here, um, it's suggested, Fog suggests that you actually start with the anchor moment or the cue and you can lock the one that seems like it's going to work for you. So I've just locked that. And then you can go back to this side and scroll through all of those um, categories of different tiny habits that you might want to pick without changing your anchor moment. And he actually suggests that you do it in that order. So once you've chosen the two parts of your recipe, so I've chosen after I turn on the kettle, I will fill a glass with water. You can see that this um, comes down up below in green with a smiley face <laughs> saying that this is a, a excellent combination. You might also get yellow, which is a good combination, and red, which is a not good combination. So this gives you just an indication using Fogg's team's experience with helping people to design tiny habits. That's what they've found. Certain things seem to work better than others when they're paired together. And he also has two other tips for you in using this recipe maker. One is to focus on choosing a habit that you really want. So as I was talking about before, it's important that it's, that it's in line with your values and that that is important to you. So one that you really want. And secondly, that it's easy for you to do. So it's easy for you personally to do that. So once you've figured out a combination that you're happy with, you can, can get the blue button below will take you to, you say, yes, I want this habit. And it will take you to the next screen, which will give you the recipe written out. So after I start the kettle, I will fill a glass with water. If you want to, you can enter your email and that will be sent to you along with some tips about how to actually implement it. And the other thing that you could do is to email that um, email that you get to a friend or a coach who could support you to keep yourself accountable with putting that tiny habit into action. 
So I'll just stop that share and go back to the slide. So there's the um, URL for the recipe maker up above. And then also I've included um, the link for his book called, also called Tiny Habits. And that goes into all of these concepts in, a, in much more depth than I've been able to do in this introduction. So if I piqued your interest at all, you can um, visit that webpage or check out the book. Okay, so just to recap about what we've been talking about this morning, um, and, and this slide also gives you my contact details if you want to ask me any more about, about anything in this or you want uh, well, you will eventually see the replay of this um, of this talk, and you can get those links if you want them. Um, but you're welcome to contact me too if you want to ask anything. So we firstly visited the material from the first part of this talk um, about the overall overall theme of starting a new habit. We talked about your vision or your why, the values underpinning your goal, the types of motivation positive emotional tractors, the SMART and the SMARTER goals, that is evaluating and revising your goals, and then the smaller action steps towards these bigger six-month or one-year goals or three-month, whatever, whatever you want to make it. And then I introduced FOG's B equals MAP model of behaviour, that is behaviour is a function of motivation, your ability to do it, and the presence of that prompt or anchor. And that's the basis of the tiny habits approach to designing an action step by scaling back the behavior or the habit that you want to establish to make it really easy to do, then you're more likely to do it even when your motivation is low. And over time, of course, you'll do more and then you'll, you'll make bigger steps towards your goal. So then we talked about choosing that prompt or that anchor to which we tie the new behaviour. So it needs to be something you do that is already firmly established in your daily routine, that is related to the new habit in terms of physical location and also the number of times that it already happens in the case of creating a new habit that you want to occur multiple times a day. And then we talked about the importance of creating that positive emotion or the feeling of celebration after we do the tiny habit to literally wire the habit into the brain via the neurochemistry of achievement and celebration. So basically we're harnessing the dopamine pathway in the brain. It's kind of like a brain hack, if you like. Um, and over time, it just becomes more natural. And then I showed, the, showed you the recipe template for the tiny habit. So A for anchor. So after I do the thing that already automatically happens in my day, I will do B, which is for for the behavior, which is scaled back to be small, tiny, easy to do. And then I will see for celebrate. So for example, after I hear the notification on my phone, I'll take a sip of water and say, good for me for supporting my brain health. Yay. Or this is another example, uh, another recipe. After I put my feet on the ground, when I wake up in the morning, I will do um, one qigong um, and um, arm exercise, you know, coordinated with the breath, you know, that nice qigong movement. And then I will say, good for me for grounding and moving my body first thing. So that's just a, a brief introduction to the idea of using tiny habits.